and click and we're live today is wednesday january 19th 2022 and we are joined with mike pesca it is 503 p.m genevieve in honor of mike's presence what are you wearing well you know dog shirts are a tradition here and i've also whipped out a feline sweater to be more accurate and i am wearing the celebratory uh blonde lab dog shirt which is one of the happiest dog shirts there is <laughs> and that is because the gist is relaunching mike uh give us the update why is the dog so happy <laughs> your vestments are like that of a catholic priest you know Around uh, Lent, it'll be purple. Around Easter, maybe more towards the pink. They all have do if, if there's white smoke coming out from from the uh, the chimney of Shea Wittes, uh, you know personnel changes are afoot. Yeah. Oh dear. <laughs> and and um, you know they say after a fat pope, a skinny pope. But the same pope, meet the new pope, same as the old pope. I will be poping it on the gist. Returning there, there now is as of a couple hours ago a trailer for season two. Season two is the next, I don't know, 1400 or so episodes. Season one was the first 1400 episodes, let's call it. Do you know why they call it a trailer? Isn't that weird that it comes before the movies? I think I know why, but you know, you know why? it never made any sense. It never it made the, any sense. Why does it? Back in the days when there were features and a main feature and uh, a newsreel, the trailer would trail the second feature. Let's say it it was it would, oh, so it would be like and come back feature. next week for uh, <laughs> for th this movie that we're going to release. I think that what happened is if there are things in order and then you put something in the middle but then you lop off the thing in the front, it'll be weird if you called the thing in the middle the trailer. It did trail something once, but now it trails nothing. <laughs> it's really We're more of the connective tissue. Well, in, in the NFL, the fullback lines up before the halfback. I don't know why that is either. But it does bring me to the gist and the return of the gist. <laughs> uh, Monday, January 24th, same exact feed, same exact name, same exact show. Same exact attitude of inquiry and rigor and productive season debate. Two. Yes, season two. What else can I say? So what else do you need to know? Will there be? Let, I, no, there's some important questions that we uh, yes. we, we got to go through here. Will there be? Is that bullshit? Yes, Maria is on board, and um, I've decided this time around to actually pay her. I don't know if she knows that yet. <laughs> she used to so, just wow. do it a friend. So, so Maria Konkova. <laughs> Uh, you know, because uh, that was one of my favorite things about the gist. You would ask her, like, to review scientific literature for you to find out whether a certain idea was bullshit. Yeah. Uh, and so that's going to that's gonna be back? It will. It started because, uh, you know, eight years ago, I was listening to a science segment. And I said to myself, it seems like what they're getting at in almost every science segment well, can it really be said to always work? And I know this is a pre-print, but it seems like the, the underlying question was always, you know, but is that bullshit? So I just cut through the, to the chase and I ask, is that bullshit? It'll be back. All right. So great. So that, that'll be back. Second question. Um, will there be a once an Antan twig, uh, 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 you know, kind of accounting for errors and, and, emails and and uh will i ever get to be the lop star of the ant ant twig the ant we have i've invested in actual lobsters that i maybe will be signing and sending to the lobsters my god the pe most of the people in this audience are probably saying what is this argo what is this strange <laughs> ant that these folks are engaged in so if a fortnight actually is most a lot of the people in this audience let's actually see let's do a poll uh, and we're going to see, have you ever listened to the gist? Uh, yes. No. All right. So before I launch this, uh, Genevieve, what do you think the percentage of people who will have listened to the gist is? Well, I can't hear you. Genevieve. She's got silent. 
Over 75. Wow. I was going to say 35 percent. And yeah. that would be like impressive to me. What do you think, Mike? It's like uh, when you hear when you hear massive bro- booing in a stadium, you're always like, oh, most of the people are booing, but it's only 35. So go going by the boo metric, I'd say 30. Ever? Oh, right now, we're, Ever? we're, yeah, I mean, I, I, so it's like right now it's over 50 percent. So, you know, we are. Um, uh, all right, let's let's go hardcore here. Have you ever heard before today of the lobster? Of the Anten twig. <laughs> and not in the red lobster. I can't spell Anten twig and I'm not even gonna try. Well um, I don't know if you know who uh invent or who discovered the word Anten twig. It was me. But I did piece it together. I did know from, that. Yeah. yeah. I did I did try to figure out what twenty one would be in old English. So Fortnite is fourteen. What would 21 be? And it would be something like an and ten twig. But I also think they have this weird letter. Oh, I wish uh, John McWhorter or one of these great linguists were here. It looks it looks like a W, but maybe acts like uh, an E. It looks like a pump. It feels like a sneaker. So I might not be saying it right. By the way, Genevieve, I knew you had a leopard on your shoulder, but until you repositioned, I didn't know it went all the way down your arm as leopards are wont to do. Yes. <laughs> But Genevieve, you are in fact still inaudible. Um, and so uh, let's have you uh, figure out your audio while Mike and I are shooting the shit about yeah. poll data. Um, but I don't know if this so, will help. I did hear very faintly the 75, as if she were two yeah. rooms away. Mono, exactly. And, uh, Maybe she I, sent it knows? to, yeah, yeah. Relayed. I, so I can actually uh, raise the gripe of the day today, which is not directed at you, or uh, it is directed at the fact that I, in a fit of uh, deciding that I was going to be doing uh, this pandemic thing for longer than I wanted to, decided it was time finally to redo my little room here with two gigantic monitors that uh, 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 could handle all of the stuff that I do wherever I do them. So I ordered two monitors and two mounters to mount them to the wall. And I bought the only two monitors in the whole fucking world that do not have a standard uh, Versa uh, mount for the, the monitor clip. So after this show, I am going to the hardware store to piece together special pieces of hardware to make these mount incl- mounting uh, pads work with this. And I just want to say I'm deeply resentful of this. I feel like, you know, given all the supply chain problems in the world, uh, if you manage to get your hands on two gigantic monitors and two mounting things, for you shouldn't have to think about no. whether they're going to be compatible with one another. No. Oh, now we can hear Genevieve like she's five miles away. Yeah. So maybe you should shout. Oh! Oh, yeah. That that's, worked. That, that, that actually works. worked. <laughs> and here from the other side of the Matterhorn will be Genevieve. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you're going to have to yell, Genevieve. Go on without me. Save yourselves. <laughs> How come no one ever shouts, come back for me. Save right. me. I'm Don't eat too. my body if I die. <laughs> I have a lot of bile and it will not be tasty. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If I get in a plane crash with a girl soccer team okay. from New Jersey, I'm definitely going to put out a lot of information about all the disgusting fluids in my body, possibly poisonous, so they won't want to eat me. Yeah, so have you, have you watched that show? Because no, I, I, just been, know, I just know it's in the cultural conversation, so I decided I, to make that And Sarah reference. Longwell is very excited about it, and um, uh, and I uh, have to say it does not uh, have any appeal for me at all. Really? Why? Did you see it? Did you like Alive? I mean, not the, uh, not the movie or book, just the fact that the soccer team had to eat themselves. Did you like that? So I, you know, didn't watch it, and I, I just, I have, like limited Donner Party vibe going on with me. I, you know, uh, I I wasn't like, I was super moved by the the, the movie, uh, the recent Agnesia Holland movie about the uh, uh, Holodomor was not so in love with the scene where the kids are eating their brother. 
uh, that didn't really didn't do it for me. And it kind of took me by surprise. And I was like, oh, I, did I need to see that? Probably no. Um, but uh, I'm... Well, and what is it with soccer teams also? I don't know. It, it yeah. never happens with, you know, with, with pole vaulters. Um, is there something like if you can't use your hands, you're more inclined to eat your teammates? I don't know. I think I'm maybe thinking too far. Well, if you those. can't use your hands because your teammates have eaten your arms. Um, what was the just, famous, you might know this, famous legal case. Um, I think that it was important in terms of English precedent, but there was a case of a sailor at sea. There was one case that yeah. inspired Robinson Crusoe. But I think there was another very important case of a sailor at sea and he ate, you know, he snacked on who he had snack on. But there was, do you know what, do you know what I'm talking about? I do. It's a, it's a very famous, and I don't remember what it's called, but it's, it's a very famous case in the development of common law precedent issues. And uh, I have to say, I've never studied it because I never went to law school. And, you know, I know. The if, one KK, time don't have... <laughs> if KK were here, she'd be like, oh, that's the, you know, the Donner Party in a boat in, in the 17th century case. And I, but I, I'm not the one who can do that because that's one of those, like, I'm not a real lawyer thing. Um, so, all right. Tell us about uh, uh, the... Uh, how the new gist will be different from the old gist I'm other trying to than make... the fact that it won't have slate involved in it yeah i'm trying to make the answer be something like nothing no difference and in fact you know there's a choice and a temptation first day back first week back how much do you uh get into everything that happened to me and why there was an 11 month interregnum and I thought, while well, tempting, and maybe it would be strategic, I thought that if you do that, then you lose the opportunity to show to the audience. But it's really, it's going to be the same show. I mean, you can say that. And so wait, you, can hope so wait, they you, you don't want to let, I mean, let's be honest, Mike, there is a serious market here for Mike Pesca, non-conservative victim of left-wing cancel culture. Uh, and you are in a position to cash in on that. And to yeah. be every conservative's favorite liberal, um, <laughs> uh, are you saying that is not what you're going to do? I got to let David Shore have have that title. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. All right, every conservative's second favorite liberal. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do think that. So no, I, it's not. I'm not going to be cashing in on anything. So a few points. I'm not going to be cashing in on anything. I hope I'll be cashing in on just the normal yes, remunerative baby. powers, right, <laughs> of, of the gist. And, you know, if, if Manscaped wants to advertise with me, God bless them. But um, I, I think that I could say I could talk about the issues a lot, but then I'll just have to make an assurance to my listeners that don't worry, we'll get back to regular gisting after a while. And I don't know, mm -hmm. I feel like I could turn many off. I have other fora such as this one, should you be so inclined to talk about the idea of liberal being a center left guy who was quote unquote canceled. If anyone wants to talk about canceling, sure. If anyone wants to talk about, you know, free expression, sure. If anyone wants to talk about the difficulty of, you know, being in a news and opinion news organization where maybe the exchange of opinions behind the scenes to make the opinions that you put out in front of the public to strengthen them, maybe, you know, it's a little, it's a lot harder in 2021 than it was when we both first started off in the business due to a changing of the sense of norms and maybe some of the other people didn't realize that norms had changed or maybe they object to some of the changes of the norms. This is all great fodder. But, you know, I will say that if you go back and listen to the gist, I have always talked about these issues, as you know, because I think you listen. I had Osita Nuevo and um, Yasha Munk on to debate each other. And I asked Yasha afterwards, even though I will say I mostly agreed with his point about is there a new form of illiberalism uh, in the ether today? I think there is. You know, I don't think that I don't think that it is. This is this is a, a ploy that is tried. Well, it's not the most important thing. No, it's not in the top 17 most important things, probably, if we had to list them all out. But it is an important thing and it is a regrettable thing and it will make discourse and understanding a lot harder. But anyway, to go back to my point, I had them debate and I, I did ask Yasha, did you think I was on your side? He said, I really couldn't tell. I take that as a point of pride. That was 
the appropriate tone for a debate. But there were other times when I talked about issues uh, in the news of cancellation, and I tried to take the tone of, yes, you're right. There are certainly people who abuse this notion. Donald Trump Jr., Bob Baffert, the horse trainer, saying cancel culture got him in the Kentucky Derby. Almost everything that Ron Johnson has ever said. Absolutely, <laughs> there are exaggerations. But, you know, there was a whole uh, debate about family values and conservatives took the mantle of family values. And they were bad faith actors on that. But does that mean that there aren't families who have values? No, it doesn't. Just because bad faith actors exaggerate the problem doesn't mean there isn't something to be concerned about. So I always said that on the show. I talked about the Harper's letter. I talked about when Megyn Kelly was ushered off for NBC show. And I, I, I did it. I was just listening to this. I did a bit, shall we say, a spiel where I said, oh, my God, did you hear Megyn Kelly did blackface? Well, she deserves. Wait, OK, it wasn't black. Oh, she she there was an old picture of her doing blackface. Wait, that wasn't it. OK, wait, what happened? Oh, Megyn Kelly discussed blackface and she offered an opinion that it could be okay in circumstances. Oh, and the next day she apologized and now she has to leave her show. You know, that's something to think about, guys. Well, I guess most of my listeners would be happy about Megyn Kelly getting bounced off NBC, but I think as a principal, that is something to be concerned about. So I've always said that. All right. I'm always so say the net, like so here's my, here's the big question that I think is lurking in the background that everybody wants Mike Pesca to address. So I'm just going to fucking throw it at you. The next time there is a controversy about somebody saying the N word. Yeah. Um, how are you going to cover it on the gist? And how are you going to talk about it with, uh, uh, mem the wider organization, well, it's, the gist is no longer part of a wider organization, the small organization of which uh, uh, you will be a part. Well, one, I, I'll never I'll never say the word. And I think that that's always been appropriate, um, especially given where I am, where I am now. There's really no need to have to say the word for me in these contexts, I think. OK, that's one. Two, I don't have to. Uh, comment on every story like that. But if one comes up and one is so captivating, I also shouldn't shy away from it. I mean, there there's a story of a University of Illinois at Chicago, Chicago, Illinois, Chicago professor who was suspended for months. And he put a an example of something that could be um, discriminatory behavior on the board. And he used just the first letter, like you just said, what you said, he wrote the letter N in a blank and the letter B in a blank. And he got in a lot of trouble because of it. Now, you know, I don't know what the wrinkle is uh, that I can add, but I certainly wouldn't shy away from discussing it. And if someone were to assert, oh, this doesn't happen, and there are people who assert that, I'd ask them, I'd ask him to look at that case and having Jesse Jackson outside this law professor's classroom calling for the guy's firing. And just tell me how you're putting this in the context of, you know, every claim about cancel culture is in the uh, Bob Baffert, Ron Johnson basket of just mythical. Like, just discuss this and tell me why this is the appropriate response. I'd love I'd love to get an answer. If I interview Jesse Jackson, that's one of the things I'd ask. Him. Genevieve? You can't, you can't really anymore. But yeah. Are you audible now? I believe I am. You are. Wow. I know. I feel so, I feel... So oh, I have monop I have because you have been inaudible. I have just monopolized the conversation, and therefore I am turning it over to you. Uh, and uh, uh, you should uh, ask whatever questions you may have. I'm going to do a hard turn and see if are there any like current news topics that you are super excited to talk about that have just been like you're just really excited to do an episode on. Yes, more than an episode. I think in my first week that what I'm going to do is the idea of civil war and revolution and the idea of the idea of civil war and revolution, because I think that there are certainly some really bad things going on. But what are the costs of jumping to this is a civil war? What are the costs of not jumping to it? I've been reading. So there's, you know, the taxonomy issue. OK, how important is it that we label this thing correctly? And what does the label mean? Um, and how and important how, Go and distinguishing that just from rhetoric? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I was reading uh, Barbara Walters, Barbara F. Walter, her book, and she makes a good case that America has some of the elements that other countries have who have had civil wars. 
but she also defines civil war in a way that is something like an established and ongoing insurgency within the country. So I don't even need the whole idea of standing armies. Like I would call the FARC a civil war. I would call the guerrillas of the Shining Path certainly a, a civil war. But I think she is calling something like Basque separatists. We should mm. consider something along those lines a civil war. I don't want America to get to that point, but I don't, you know, Charlie Warzel, who we're working to get on the show, he's written about that. We're interviewing a guy who, who wrote a book, um, Stephen March, wrote a book called The Next Civil War, and he puts the chances of a civil war at 67%. And my first question <laughs> is going to be, how in the world could you say anything higher than 66.3? Well, you do know that 99% <laughs> of statistics are made up on the spot. So I would like to know how he got those numbers. But I, I, I want to say that Barbara and I'm, I'm a, Barb and I have done work together. I, I like her a great deal. And I think she's really smart. But she's using the term civil war as, as a synonym of conflict. Yes. And I think if you ask the question, if you, uh, what are the chances of the, the United States having a civil war in the context, like with civil war being defined as like different territories, you know, with armies, the chances yeah. are zero. Right. Um, if you Is ask Ken the, Burns going to make a documentary on it? That's the right. standard. <laughs> right. If you ask the question, is there a possibility of political violence? What's the chance of political violence? The answer is it's pretty considerable, right? But, right. It would, but we have, you know, the president of the United States controls the United States military forces, which, you know, may not be able to handle the Taliban over 20 years, but are very capable of, like, you know, poli you know, taking controlling the territory of the United States. And I just think, like, I, I do think there's a terminological problem with the way people are using civil war. Yes, and in the periods, there have always been Michigan Michigan militia. I think I almost said Michigan militia. Yeah, yeah. militia. <laughs> the Michigan, Which also there's works. <laughs> there's always, always been the uh, Michigan militia type. And before that, you know, of course, the Klan is this quasi-military organization that was extremely, and a lot of other things, extremely prominent. And we know how they marched on Washington during the uh, Coolidge administration and turned the, she the streets white with hatred. So if we had the term then, I, I think part of saying we're on the brink of the Civil War, and that is new, maybe we should be saying we're on the brink of a Civil War, as we've kind of always been. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I would just say, um, if the question is, are we at significant risk of political violence? The answer is, of course. Of course. In fact, we've already had some significant yeah. political violence. Right. If the, question, and if the if FBI it, didn't break up, I, I mean, I guess we could gainsay how legitimate the Michigan threat was, but seems somewhat legitimate, even though a bunch of them were uh, in on it with the government. But that's how it happens. And that's how terrorism prosecution happens. You know, if the FBI wasn't on that, we could have had that. We could have had a dozen other things like that. Right. And if the question is how many, what's the likelihood of armies confronting armies of Americans on American soil, uh, the answer is vanishingly small. So, I, I mean, I agree with Barb's sense of the uh, the signs are ominous of a descent into a violent period. Uh, I just don't know that I think civil war is the right vocabulary for that. We're not we're not the former Yugoslavia that's gonna you know fracture and the old Yugoslav army is gonna break up into you know the 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 black part of the U.S. military and the the white part and the liberal part and the conservative like we don't have a analog to that and um, uh, and the command and control of the U.S. military is awfully good it's not we're not going to have that specific set of problems and maybe you know the '60s days of rage you know Todd Gillen's book uh, I think Years of Hope Years of Rage maybe it's we're having the rage, but without the hope. Um, hmm. Maybe it's a hopeless rage. But the 60s were a time of just 
you know, mass urban bombings. And I think you could say, what is the phrase you use? Sustained political violence. People forget this, and I gotta say, I even forget this until one Eve Guman reminded me of it the other day, but a minister of the uh, 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 provincial government of Quebec was found in the trunk of a car, uh, murdered in 1969. Uh, you know, like, it wasn't just us. It was like, there was serious, like that period, you know, had all kinds of, uh, you know, it was the one period of Quebec separatism that was violent. We had Puerto Rican uh, separatist violence. At the, U at the U.S. Capitol. At the U.S. Capitol. Yeah. Um, you we know, had, it's like... Murders at the, um, um, uh, what is the name of the saloon in downtown Manhattan where Washington had his... Francis uh, Tavern. Tavern. Francis Tavern. We had, the oldest we had literal building in New York City. We had it's literal wonderful. political assassinations at Francis Tavern. Um, this was widespread. This was widespread political violence. It was happening throughout the world, the Bader-Meinhof gang, and now people are going to say, wait a minute, where have I heard that term before? But the Bader-Meinhof gang, the Red Army, um, Diamond, what is the, the Stanford professor, Diamond. Carlos the Jackal. <laughs> Carlos the Jackal. <laughs> Everybody's favorite Venezuelan... Uh, uh, terrorist on behalf of the Palestinian cause uh, who then goes to Libya and converts to Islam and, and Muammar Gaddafi protects until the French finally get him in, you know, pretty recently. Yeah, um, uh, yeah Carlos the Jackal was awesome. He was, one, he was one of the great terrorists of the period. If he, was, if he was just like Carlos the Walrus, would we even care? No I one mean, would give a maybe, shit. Maybe, maybe if it was the narwhal, but not the walrus. I mean, <laughs> no, narwhals stop terrorist attacks. They do. There's They're that, very defensive by nature. No, that guy in London who uh, there was a, a terrorist attack on the streets of of, of London, and uh, somebody was killing people with a giant knife, yeah. and this guy pulls a narwhal horn. Uh, Tusk off the wall of the pub that he's in and goes after the terrorist with the narwhal tusk and stops the this. terrorist attack. No, no, just, you know, Google narwhal tusk I believe terrorist you, attack. <laughs> it, it is one of the great moments stopping a terrorist attack. Um, oh, yeah, I would just get a site. Um, Blank on his I have totally name. thrown off the conversation here. No, 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 no. An interesting, conver an interesting theory I heard about why America was relatively, and maybe you want to take Britain, was relatively um, unscathed by all this political violence, whereas, you know, in Italy and Germany it erupted, is that these were the children of those who fought in World War II. And if you fought on the right side of World War II, there'd be some, first of all, it was a baby boom, there'd be some tumult, but you wouldn't look at your, literally, your ancestors as, you know, worthy of, worthy of assassination, right? So, but in, but in Germany and Italy, there was so much more, let's say, surus, <laughs> if we're speaking of Michigas, there was so much more angst in society that the terrorism took on a much, uh, a much deadlier edge. But anyway, the point is, to bring this up, we have been through this before. And I find it interesting that when people valorize or romanticize an age in America where things were good, um, it is often the 60s and 70s. You know, yeah. Kurt Anderson has made the case to me that he'd rather have been or people should take should take the offer of would you rather be an adult working in the 70s or an adult today just because of things like job security and the strength of unions. This was a time, I don't know, I always think we just look back at the past with rose-colored glasses, but the exact time of the most violence, um, a time we're trying to, we're wringing our hands about saying, should we put this label of revolutionary on our current time, was happening then. And it is also the time, some people, I guess conservatives, tend to like the 50s more. But, but many people would say the 60s and 70s were at least the heydays for the average worker in America. Okay, so here's the question, Mike Pesca. Do you agree that 1970s are, in fact, the golden age of American cinema and that this whole 
bullshit thing we have about the 40s and 50s is really a lot of romantic nonsense and that actually the greatness of American film really begins with the creation of the R rating in 1969 and um, and you know that the, the great flowering is the early 1970s. So should we embrace the uh, easy rider, uh, raging bull way of looking at things? Or <laughs> well, like start more? start with the conversation in 1967, right? This is a movie that you 67? know. 67? It was that early? I think it's 67. And then you have. I thought it was, 60, I thought it was like you, right. I thought it was right before um, Mean Streets, but. And I then you have like 60. Early, you have 69. Uh, you have Midnight Cowboy which is a movie that simply could not have been made before the rating system. And right. then you have The Godfather. Uh, you have, um, you know, you have, uh, a, you know, like Dog Day Afternoon, these these movies that were just way too, too violent and sexually weird to be made before the... Uh, 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 and so my theory is that we've actually completely misplaced. The conversation was 1974, says Drew Rickett. Uh, sorry, my, uh, so uh, my point is that I think we've just completely misplaced the period of greatness of American film. I think, fine, but then you put up against that everything George Cukor did, every, most everything Billy Wilder did, every bit of the entire film noir genre, almost all of Hitchcock. Eh, okay, was he American? He was for his later years. Uh, yeah, there was a great flourishing of being able to show the Midnight Cowboy and the violence, Bonnie and Clyde and Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch, you know, two early violent films, and I love a great violent film. But, you know, there's another argument that the Hayes Code is what made, you know, made put the put the wraps on free expression. So you had to find ways to intimate that. And you would do that with suggestive lighting and looks and, and, and uh, hints. And there's a great pleasure there's a great artist martin scorsese completely impossible before the ratings i think a genius could flourish in any in any era i think scorsese would, would, he would have, have found would a way seen, would you think so yeah i, I think if cagney i think that if he had access to cagney instead of uh, de niro i think game on he'd have been he'd have made great mobster movies then. all right well what about um uh, what about when louis mal comes to america and starts making French films in the United States. You know, you get Pretty Baby, you get Atlantic City. Atlantic City yeah. Like these are not, uh, you know, shit that you could do before. Uh, I just think, you know, were we attracting great French directors before 1970? French, no, but German, yes. I mean, yeah, that's true. <laughs> it depends. But it, like freaking on... Truffaut didn't come to the United States, right? But Louis Mal did. Uh, he was married right. to Campus Bergen, right. and you know that may have been an attraction. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, <you> know, slightly. <laughs> what was I, I mean? I think that bo in both cases, the filmmakers, the artists, were speaking to their era and speaking around the constraints not only placed upon them, but what the public would bear. You know, there were there were very ambitious filmmakers in the uh, '40s and '50s who. So you're um, not going to go with me on this. But the <laughs> '70s is 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 the is. Oh, the, you didn't even mention Spielberg and Jaws and Star Wars. That would be two good arguments for you, right? And they they don't do it for me. <laughs> no. Um, well, I don't like Spielberg so much. I, I do. I mean, Raiders like... Raiders of the Lost Ark, granted, early '80s remade yeah. that entire genre better than the entire genre is. And if you I, could say, I would trade them all <laughs> for Alien. Mm. Yeah, that's good. I think Alien is one of the great, un, you know, unsung American films just as a creative redefinition of what you could do with a form. I love the film Alien. I think it's it's uh, brilliant, and I still sometimes wake up in the middle of the night. Like... <laughs> <laughs> do you scream? Uh, because if you scream and and your wife hears you then that's a good sign that you're not I, in space i kick and punch actually and uh <laughs> oh, you know no. it's 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 bad I, I when when i get attacked by the alien at night it, it's very violent um you do not go softly into that good night <laughs> no i don't all right um uh genevieve should we go to audience questions i think that we got some good ones 
By the way, we have, uh, I just want to say I came very close to the right answer on the percentage of in lieu of fun audiences that have listened to the gist. It's, I said 35%. It's actually about 39%. Mm -hmm. uh, only a third of whom, for a quarter of whom, uh, have uh, listened or remember listening to the Lobstar of the Antan Twig. So I think you're going to need to do better Lobstar promotion, Mike. Um, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Um, all right, we're going to invite Tony Kava on. We're going to invite Dan Botts on. And we're listen, invite... chorus. We have the opportunity to change the statistics, so it's more weighted my way. So please check out the season two. Exactly, David Botts. The floor is yours. Hey, David. Hi, everybody. Um, Mr. Pesca, it is wonderful to see you, and I. Uh, I'm just so excited at being able to hear you again. <laughs> uh, have you in my ears Monday through Friday. It's it's fabulous. Uh, I'm really excited, really happy. So um, who is your distributor? And how has this changed your perspective on podcasting, uh, specifically with respect to business models, free speech, et cetera? So thanks. Yeah. We have, I guess, the distributor is us. I don't know if you would say distributor. We're doing the show in association with Libsyn, which is, you know, an original, um, an old school company that would host, hosting company, host uh, podcast feeds. Liberated now, syndication. It's liberated. It's <laughs> taking the syndication. It's liberating it for the yeah, people. It's, it's like, you know, it's <laughs> like, uh, you know, the podcast lib movement from the from the early seventies. Oh yeah, that's right. People are uh, burning these corded uh, earpieces. <laughs> it's all it's all the rage. But they have uh, they have a company, a sub company who I work with directly called Advertise Cast, and their staff seems great. Um, it makes it hasn't it it has affirmed things I thought about the podcast industry. And here's the big thing, and it directly relates to. The negotiations that I had to do to extract myself from Slate and I guess vice versa. The, there is such a problem in podcasting with discovery. Um, what is it's so hard for any podcast that doesn't have another show or a huge podcast pointing to it to get any traction? You know, one way around this is a celebrity starts a podcast or so someone with already a couple million followers starts their own podcast. But that's not a sustainable model. I, I got a solution to this problem. You yeah. can start a podcast and do it with no audience for 10 fucking years <laughs> until it develops audiences, which is what we did with the Lawfare podcast. How did, and yeah, I'll ask you a question about that in a second. But so what's really, really valuable is the feed, the feed that I've always been on because that's where people know where to find me. And I just put up a trailer today and already thousands of people are downloading it because I have the feed. And if I didn't have the feed and I put that up, you know, the people from this show will hear and people who follow me on Twitter, but it's so hard to get the word out. So these feeds are worth their weight and they have no weight. They're just kind of an idea, but these feeds are immeasurably valuable. And I knew that and it very much affected my decisions and how, in, uh, how to go forward what a podcast company is. And this also, I really was thinking about it. Why are some podcast companies successful? Pod Save America or Gimlet or so forth, taking away who was bought by whom. They had one big hit. And once you have, or they start off with a big hit, Pod Save America has a big hit because they deserve to have a big hit. And they're somewhat of an early mover and they provide the audience what they want and they have good experts. But once you have a big hit, then you could say we're a network, then your big hit can direct people to the other hits on your show. So the a podcast network is just basically one or two huge shows, you know, Pushkin and Malcolm Gladwell show. And that is the spine. And then you can tell other people about your different vertebra. But if you as a podcast or some phalanges all the way over here, it's really, really hard to get noticed or to get any uh, attraction from the spine. Now I realize in this analogy, the spine, the finger, the listener might be meningitis. So I worry about that, but. <laughs> so uh, it is, I it's think it's so hard to listen. It's so hard to find a new show and it's criminally hard, I think. I think that is exactly right. And as, as somebody who has had exactly two successes in developing significant audience, uh, uh, 
in a smaller way, rational security was a success, but that's a, uh, it's a much smaller proposition. Uh, one was a 10 year project, literally. It was just, we were doing it for whoever would listen because it was fun to do and because it was an interesting way of expanding Lawfare's content. And then Bob Mueller came around and a lot of people around the world suddenly discovered that we had better thing, more interesting things to say about it than anybody else did. Um, but that was it. That was the, that was the, uh, it wasn't just it, the Trump administration, it was the Mueller investigation. Well, I, I think the Mueller investigation was the, was the, you know, the fentanyl that, that drove it. But I, I do think the, you know, the Trump administration in general caused a lot of people to think about lawfare substantive offerings uh, more generally. And look, we haven't, we haven't lost that audio audience as the Mueller investigation went away. That audience has stuck with us. And so I think it's a, it's not just that, but I, but I do think that was catalytic for, uh, but look, the other one is a, is a classic example of the exact point that Mike is making. Why did the report hit the jackpot the way it did? Uh, and the jackpot here is literally, it was a couple weeks, it was number one on Apple Podcasts charts. And the reason is Rachel Maddow tweeted it, you know, and showed a, uh, played a clip of it, of its opening episode. And, you know, we have a similar project going on now for the, uh, uh, for one six, uh, and it doesn't have anything like the size of the audience. And the difference is, you know, one decision by one Rachel Maddow to, you know, say, hey, I think she tweeted like a link to it and, oh my God, this is really good or something. And that's why it had, you know, 400,000 downloads on the first episode of it. Chris Holst, you're an orange rectangle, but the floor is yours, despite, I, I mean, I don't have a lot of prejudices in life, but orange rectangles are really, like, I, I do actually tend to discriminate against them. Mm -hmm. uh, notwithstanding that fact, the floor is yours. Uh-oh. Chris Holst. You are not only an orange rectangle, but you are an, an inaudible <laughs> orange rectangle, which I must say is not the single most useless thing you can be on, um, on, <laughs> on, on be, because actually um, it's a fun joke, um, but uh, it is not um, uh, uh, a super, uh, it's not good for engagement. So I'm mm -hmm. going to read your question. No. Is the mass shooting epidemic a symptom of an undiagnosed civil war? Uh, what do you think? Well, no, I mean, the vast majority, okay, is the mass, the mass shooting epidemic is, I think he means, you know, just judging by his combination of yellow and red and 360 degrees and four corners. But I think he means not the 21,000 people who are murdered, but the couple hundred people who are murdered 10 at a time. Yeah. Right? Right. I, that's an epidemic of well, almost none of the, the, those are often, or at least the ones we pay attention to, but I think also often done by disaffected teens who have almost no political motivation. I think it's a sign of the ready availability of guns and especially the allure of the uh, AR-15. And I really yeah. don't, I don't think the AR, if you ban the AR-15, it wouldn't have that huge an effect on the overall murder rate. But there's something so attractive about that particular model and others of its ilk. I would try the experiment to ban it and see if you have any good effects. I mean, at least but, it would limit the damage. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Yeah. Tony Kava, it is good to see your face. Hi, Tony. Yes. Uh, welcome back. Thank you. And uh, the floor is yours. I'm sorry, I'm Chris the Holst. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it was not uh, intentional. Um, Tony, what's on your mind? Hey, I need a shave. Oh my God, I look horrible. <laughs> It's true. You have more hair on your chin than you do on your head. I have more hair on my chest than I have on my 
Jim we did, that's an overshare, <laughs> dude. We didn't need to know that. Let's go, let's go, Tony Kava, body part by body part. And yes, <laughs> there you go. I have I have more hair in my ears than I have. On my ears. All right. Meanwhile, back on Earth, <laughs> we have, 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 have you ask a my question. Little finger than you. <laughs> I know exactly. This is kind of like the Congress of bald men here. Uh, <laughs> So, hey, uh, Mike, I had a couple of sports questions for you. If yeah. I could. Um, the first one is about Formula One, and I won't ask it if you don't follow the sport. I don't. It's a huge Okay, then let's leave me. that one aside because okay. it, it would take way too long to explain. Uh, the second one is about football. Do you follow football at all? Very much because I have all okay. this time from not spending yeah. my time with Formula One to watch the NFL, yeah. There you go. Yeah, Formula One is actually quite – uh, time intensive to follow. Uh, my question on football is about the the expanded season and the expanded playoff format. And I'm wondering how you feel about that. Uh, it seems to me that stretching the season out, you get more and more players injured. I'm surprised the unions go for it. And then having this expanded playoff format, it kind of becomes like the NHL or the NBA, where like mm. you know, 80% of the teams make the playoffs. The last half of the season doesn't mean a great deal. I guess that's not quite true in, in the NFL. But, uh, you know, as a 49er fan, I kind of benefited from this because I got to see a 10-7 and 7 49er team beat the number one seed Dallas Cowboys. But I think there was a lot of pretty crappy playoff games this weekend. And I'm just yeah. wondering how you feel about that. I think that, well, first of all, 14 teams out of 32 make the playoffs in the NFL and in the NBA, it's 16 teams out of 30. So it is still harder to make the playoffs. And since the NFL only has 16, now a 17-week season, you could argue that they should have a greater and expanded field because 17 weeks isn't a real great test to see who is the best team. So much is dependent on the fact that they play wildly disparate schedules. Yeah. So, you know, the teams, the eighth team that sneaks into the NBA playoffs is a bad team it's often a bad team and even though oh i didn't like the eagles as a team this year it seemed like the seven seeds in each conference weren't great there were teams that didn't make the playoffs that were good you know the chargers they're a good team indianapolis might be a good team i think we just happened stick with the format give it a couple years i bet you next year or the year after that we're going to get some great games in the first week and everyone will be saying oh what a what a blessing i like the I like the fact that it has an ex one extra game uh, this weekend. I also like the fact that there is only one seed that gets a buy. So yeah. winning the whole division becomes important. I think it's a fine experiment. But as far as injuries, you're right. More football means more injuries. It's the only sport where they, they negotiate. Hey, would you like to do more of your job? We would. But here's the thing. <laughs> we don't want to break our legs. Yeah. Brad Grossman. The floor is yours. Hello, Mike. Thank you for being here. I'm very excited that they just is coming back. And I, I was just wondering if you did anything in your 11 months off to kind of keep up your interviewing slash monologuing abilities. Did you, are your neighbors sick and tired of you, you know, <laughs> stopping in the hallway and asking them questions? Right. At, at night, I say to the kids, and now the spiel. Can we just have <laughs> Phantom Toll Booth, Dad? has to be the spiel all the time. Uh, what I did was, and I couldn't help it. It wasn't to sharpen my skills. There were a couple of really compelling trials, Derek Chauvin being chief among them. And I would watch these trials. I watched, I literally watched, not in full speed, but almost, can you literally almost watch every minute? I think I might've watched every minute of the Derek Chauvin trial, double speed, most of it. I'd, I'd wait and then watch it on YouTube. And I took notes as if I had a show to do. I'm not sure why, but at this point, I think it's just how I process the news. So if I had a show, you'd sure be hearing a lot of great insights about the Derek Chauvin trial. Um, the Rittenhouse trial was also really interesting. And I know from doing that, that many, many of the people who they called on TV to analyze the verdict were not watching the trial because pundits would express surprise, for instance, that um, actually, no, uh, let me let me amend that. This was the uh, Kim Potter trial, the Brooklyn Center police woman who 
shot a gun instead of a taser. And I remember the pundits expressing surprise that she had moved out of state. Oh, the judge should be shocked at that. And just screaming at my TV. She said it under oath. If you were watching the trial, you know she said it. So this is, this is one of the things I did. I pretended I had a show. Wow. So I want to ask you something about, about that is bad, pretending you have a show. Because, like, do you feel like you are out of practice? No, no. Because I don't, I think of it as like, like, you will die in the middle of interviewing somebody or, uh, or like monologuing about something. That's actually so innate to who you are. That it's like that's not something you need to, to practice. Out. Exactly. My the the answer to that is my best friends say sometimes the ones who listen. Oh yeah, I guess I haven't talked to you in a couple months, but since I listen to the show every day, it's like I talk to you all the time, <laughs> because that is my personality. That is, you know, Howard Stern. They say turns it on and turns it off, and is so withdrawn in real life. But they're but they say Jimmy Fallon is kind of always on. I don't know if I'm always on, but it is a very accurate distillation of my personality. So I will just say, as somebody who met you after listening to The Gist, meeting you is like listening to The Gist. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not its not like there's a, a persona that's the, you know, uh, 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 bom, 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 <laughs> persona, and then there's the actual Mike Pesca. They're freaking the same person. All Again, right, was, Alaric... it off -putting, was it off-putting when we were getting drinks when I asked you if you wanted to buy some stamps.com and tried to sell you on that, the fact? You know, I was a little put off by that, <laughs> but then I figured, hey, it's just authentic, you know? He's Who like... does it? <laughs> so, all right, I have been meaning to ask this question of Alaric for a long time. Uh, uh, Alaric the first is, of course, the uh, the the gentleman uh, of the uh, uh, of the uh, goth persuasion who sacked Rome in in uh, 416 right maybe? somewhere in there uh, somewhere right over there yeah. so is that your actual name and how did you come by it and have you ever <laughs> sacked Rome <laughs> no I haven't but that, that is my actual name my my Excellent. father my father was quite a scholar he was an anthropologist archaeologist fill in the blankologist. Um, and he, I hope I'm not echoing bad. No, no it sounds bad. great on our end. Um, he, he being an anthropologist and such, did not trundle me off to church every Sunday. He had four boys. I was the youngest. So he sought a name from sort of the, the Northern European realm that went with Hag, my last name, that wasn't steeped in Christianity. And he found Alaric in a history book. Well, when I was a teenager, <laughs> he read a new history of Alaric and discovered that Alaric, yes, sacked Rome, killed every occupant of the city. He was the first one to successfully do so. But he left the city intact and moved in. And he was ultimately so taken with their architecture and their cathedrals that he converted to Christianity. <laughs> so the last lap. <laughs> yeah, so I just want to say about, about old Alaric that uh, one of the reasons that I think he's so interesting, uh, and we're going to go to your question, uh, is that uh, his means of sacking Rome was to lead a large Gothic army down the Appian Way, uh, uh, which proves that, you know, you build all these roads, these great Roman roads to project power out from Rome, <laughs> and they become the mechanism by which right. the Vandals and the Goths and the Visigoths come and, you know, sack you. And that is right. basically a great metaphor for the internet. Um, you know, oh, wow. we built it to project power out, right. and they're kind of our Roman roads, and now the Russians attack us with it. You know, uh, yeah. so it's I a, think it's there's a, a lot of... It's a series of tubes, but it should have been a series of aqueducts. Yeah, that, exactly. That analogy and and really... I just think it's really, you know, just something that we got to talk about whenever you come on the show. Anyway, well, uh, you get the last question today, well, and, uh, and... but don't sack Rome, please. Right. The, don't, the quick... don't click him off when he's done. I want to I want to do a visual, but go ahead, Alaric. All right. The, uh, the quick uh, coda to the story is that Alaric's political power was so vast 
that he decreed that he be buried in the bed of a river. So they had to dam the river, bury him in the dried river, and then undam it to bury his remains and protect them from ever being disturbed. And I'm trying like hell to figure out how I can get enough political power to do that to the mighty Mississippi here in Baton Rouge. Well, you got to keep working on that because I think I, I think if you it's, fail, it's only a mile wide here. If you fail to live up to your namesake on this, it will be uh, written on your gravestone somewhere, know, buried like a normal mortal. But Louisiana mm -hmm. politics are such that it's not out of the realm of possibility. Very well yeah. said. And also, you can't bury yourself in the ground, right? That's not available to you. Uh, or is that largely more that is Southern. not done here, uh, you know, especially yeah. New Orleans. Everything is above ground. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, yeah, this is great to talk to you, Mike. Uh, I love the, the gist. Um, and I will tell those who have not uh, do, don't have a history. There's not an interview that Mike Pesca does that the the interviewee finally says, wow, that's a really good question. <laughs> and so kind of dovetailing off of the previous question, where did you get your interviewing chops? Where did you hone that craft? Or is it just that you've done so much research on the guest? I try to do a lot of research. I oh, also I'm sorry, you told oh. me not to dismiss Alaric, yeah. and I just dispatched him gone? like a like a goth. Uh, let me bring him back while you're talking. Well, I'll, I'll answer by showing this is the flag of Kiribati, Kiribati it's spelled. Can you see it pretty well? And if Alaric was holding a golden uh, dove above his head, if Alaric was he oh, would wow. be there was a lot about him that reminds me of the flag of Kiribati. Well, I just want to say you are <laughs> the rare podcast host who, when you see something, you're you've got like vexillology uh, <laughs> corner going on. Uh, and so you can like, corner. oh, I, that Max is, uh, matches up against the flag of Kiribati. Really? I meant <laughs> to assure the, the choristers that I'm not Tony back on because I too am bald and unshaven. And <laughs> That's <laughs> true, although Tony doesn't look anything like the flag of Kiribati. <laughs> <No>. right. <laughs> That's right. He's Kazakhstan at best. Um, <laughs> another, another bird flag. Um, so the answer is uh, what you said in research. I also, I guess, trained at NPR, and I had a seat in the New York office, and there was a desktop switcher, and you could listen to everything that was going on in every control room. And when Terry Gross, who I consider a great interviewer, when she had a guest on, I would listen, and I would always listen to the raw interviews. So one of the things that makes Terry Gross a great interviewer is that she's not in, she knows she's not interviewing for the air she knows she's interviewing for an edit and then that goes on the air and so you can really hear different sentence constructions different ways to get at an answer kind of tricks of the trade so i that was very helpful and then i listen to interviews now and when i hear a great question or line of questioning i take note for instance you ever have tyler cowan on the show Ben? We have never had Tyler Cowen, but I am a fan. I think he's very I'm a fan. And interesting. He does a lot of good things. He does a lot of things well. Um, and interviewing is one of them, and he does a ton of research. But recently he was interviewing, uh, I forgot who it was, and he said, what is the thing that whoever he was interviewing, what is the, the thing that those in your epidemiologists or earthquake experts, what are the things that you debate about when you guys get together. What a great question. What a great way to kind of penetrate um, a, a, maybe a controversial subject who's a little bit defensive, right? And you say, okay, well, what are the big disagreements among members of the Proud Boys? I'd like to hear that answer, you know? And it's a good way to get at the question. That's amazing. We are gonna leave it there. Mike Pesca, you're a great American. It is fabulous uh, to uh, that the gist is coming back. What day is it coming back? Monday, January 24th. Where can people find it? Where they found it before. And what if they'd never found it before? What do you have to do to find the gist? Well, you'd search for it in Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. You ignore the show 
That is like uh, Crane's gist of Chicago business <laughs> and the gist of women's sports. Although we did have an applicant who said, I'd love to work on your show. I love women's sports. I'm a huge <laughs> feminist. Like me too, but here's the thing. <laughs> so it's All right. just with me. <laughs> and we are going to be back uh, two days before the gist uh, returns on Monday. We will be back, I guess, three days on Friday with Anita Krishna Kumar, mm -hmm. uh, who has recently written a, a very provocative critique of Justice Gorsuch. Uh, and that will be 22 hours, uh, sorry, 46 hours and 58 minutes from now. And until then, Genevieve Della Fera. We don't have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun, we have, well, you know, you get the gist. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Congratulations, Mike.